And I like the idea of without borders because I think that Médecins Sans Frontières is breaking a lot of borders and not just geographical ones, but in terms of healthcare and disease control and things like that, and doctors, the role of a doctor, all that. Médecins Sans Frontières has gone way beyond our traditional understanding of that. Unfortunately, more and more borders are also being raised. I think uh, humanitarian space is much less accepted now. Gone are the days where um, you can simply um, arrive uh, and, uh, and just look for interlocutors locators and start working. Now uh, we find as an organization, our humanitarian space is increasingly restricted uh, to the point where we're persecuted, uh, hounded out of a country, etc, etc. Uh, and so um, I'd say that over the years, the 20 years I've worked for the organization, there are more borders. And so therefore, it's even more important to be without borders. As regards uh, healthcare, yes, I think we are on the um, innovative edge of the spectrum. That's clear. We're in a position to try and test new protocols uh, and, uh, um, and certainly drugs as well. We've got some big drug tests going on at the moment linked to tuberculosis in third world settings. There's a lot of innovation going on. I'd say we definitely challenge borders. Uh, that's clear. Uh, um, but um, we also respect them. We're 99% financed by private individuals mm -hmm. who give their funds with no political allegiance whatsoever. So that's unlike, for example, the United Nations, which is absolutely politically oh, financed. Oh, absolutely, um, yeah. But we want to maintain our independence and neutrality. Uh, and um, so that's one thing. Where does the funding come from? The funding, absolutely, that allows us to be as neutral and impartial as possible. And secondly, whenever we work, the focus is on uh, the patients, regardless of where they come from, their, their gender, their ethnicity, uh, their political affiliations, their sexuality, uh, uh, their anything. And so um, anyone who's a patient is a patient is a patient. And we try and uh, we, we do this by um, working on both sides of the front line if there's a conflict situation. Mm. Um, for example, in Sudan at the moment, we're on there's, there's a, as you know, there's civil war in yeah. Sudan and uh, um, and we're on both sides, absolutely, of, of the of, uh, of um, in the, the areas where they're controlled. We're on both sides of the, of the front line, transparently so. Uh, voilà. um, and also in terms of um, how we present our, our, our healthcare uh, to try and make it as inclusive as possible, uh, and to ensure that no particular uh, population feels in any way excluded. When we do our um, uh, our witnessing, our témoignage, as we call it in French, uh, then when we speak out, we we, we uh, we, we speak out from the point of view of the patient, not from the point of mm. view of uh, um, any political affiliation. That's a good example of uh, um, innovative use of transport options that are locally available. Uh, and so our standard ones are, are um, the Toyota Land Cruiser. Uh, I mean, that's uh, the, the tool of humanitarians everywhere. But there are places where that doesn't go. Uh, and um, so, for example, in Ethiopia, rainy season challenges and so I um, uh, engaged a fleet of donkeys uh, for ambulance transport because at the time we were dealing with um, uh, nutrition, uh, malnourished children, and most of the cases weren't time critical for the transport from the outreach centres to the local, the centralised hospital. In other words, the patients could comfortably bumble along at donkey pace for six hours, and that was okay because we, you know, sheltered um, from the sun and the elements, and it was reasonably comfortable. Uh, and uh, that was, in fact, a more comfortable uh, and easy way of transporting patients from, from diverse different areas out in the rural community towards a, a more centralized therapeutic feeding center. And so we innovative, in, innovative, it's not that innovative to use donkeys. People have been using donkeys for millennia, but you see what I mean? I mean, it's a, yes. it's a change of, of the usual way of doing things. Uh, and along with that came, of course, you know, uh, welfare of the animal was very important to us in the same way that welfare as the car is important when you're using cars. And I built it sounds silly, but a logbook for donkeys. I engaged a local vet, etc. And so you know, as much care and thought went into the management of that fleet of donkeys as it went into the management of the fleet of vehicles that we had as well. Uh, and so, yes, yeah, so I think access, you talked about neutrality and impartiality and independence. Access is a very important part of that. And if the patients can't get to the healthcare facilities, then we go to where the patients are. If they need transport and if the transport can't happen in in, in uh, uh, Ministry of Health ambulances, then we we start running transport services as well. I Correct. read the yeah, yeah, description yeah. on the website for the Nobel Peace Prize, and the uh, descriptions very um, corresponds very much to what you're saying about the way you work mm -hmm. and what your goals are. That that's a major accomplishment. That was a long time ago, 1999. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and I think um, um, 
And why the messages haven't changed since 1999 is because we have a charter since 50 years, uh, which has been slightly updated to uh, make sure it fits with the time, but it remains a one-page document, the MSF Charter, um, which is uh, um, uh, it's still as relevant today as it was 50 years ago uh, when it was written. Um, and, uh, and, and we stuck to that over time. It's really our mission statement uh, and, uh, and it's very useful. And so we stick to that and we're all, it's all good. We're very heavily involved uh, in support to migrants uh, and, and refugees mm -hmm. uh, and um, um, all over the world. I mean, uh, um, will it be, for example, now in Chad because because of the civil war in Sudan, yeah. people are crossing the border from Chad into Sudan again, as they have been doing in the past. I was there myself in 2005 and, and saw it happening then. There was a war going on back mm -hmm. then. But not only, uh, um, also in Europe, uh, um, there's uh, obviously the whole route that people yeah. take traveling out from uh, um, Africa and Asia up into, into Europe, mm -hmm. um, often heading to England. And often we see people along the route uh, and we've got, because we've got multiple projects along the way. We're heavily operational in Italy, Bosnia, Serbia, France, uh, in the UK as well. We're busy, we're, we're operational in the UK um, to try and uh, ensure that these people have health care because they often don't. Uh, it's definitely got worse. Uh, social media um, is an intensifier of, of uh, disinformation, misinformation. So that's, I'd say that's how it's got worse. And I think there's been a breakdown in trust in general in uh, um, all kinds of different uh, areas, but also um, towards doctors. I mean, uh, the position of your average doctor in society, there's less trust, yeah. put it that way. Uh, but not only in doctors, also in teachers, uh, in, in other professions yeah. as well. Yeah. And so um, we've got um, a whole project, we call it the Dismiss uh, Project, uh, Disinformation Misinformation Project. Mm. Uh, and um, yes, we've got com communications departments and teams to work and counter and, and put out uh, um, the message as we have for years. But I think what it really comes back to is we want to maintain our integrity about the information that we communicate. There's two ways of doing that. The first is to let the patient speak for themselves and give them a platform to speak. And so it comes directly from the source as opposed to speaking on their behalf or having porte parole mm -hmm. or, or uh, uh, spokespersons on their behalf. Uh, and so we try to do that. Um, you know, the, the default situation is that, you know, when you look at the MSF websites, what I hope you shall see is you hope you'll see patients speaking out about what they're experiencing rather than MSF staff interpreting what they think the patients are thinking. We've worked a lot with the influences, um, for example, everything around HIV AIDS out of Kinshasa. We worked with local influences in Congo mm. who are present on TikTok, Instagram, social media, etc. to pass messages. We did a, we filmed a great song. It's really good fun. And people dancing, there's healthcare messages, etc. <laughs> around messages, the healthcare messages around HIV AIDS. Uh, voilà. Theatre, a lot of theatre. There's a, there's an awful lot of theatre groups. Um, where uh, in Liberia, I I, uh, I hired a local theatre group to to spread a message about um, if you're a, a victim of sexual or gender based violence, come to the clinic. Uh, and uh, the medium which we use are, are designed to be uh, accessible to all of our patients, and as fifty percent of our patients are children, uh, uh, to them too. Uh, absolutely. Beyond that, when you look beyond children to sort of young adults and teenagers, we've been training uh, for years healthcare professionals, uh, but now we've taken it to a next level in, in uh, the last seven or eight years, uh, and we've, we've opened the MSF Academy for Healthcare, um, which um, not only provides training, but also provides certification because we work with local universities to, for example, we took um, 50 midwives uh, um, from Sierra Leone, and they went to Ghana because there's no um, um, midwifery school uh, um, of the particular type we were looking for in Sierra Leone. There was a better offer of education in Ghana. So they went there for two years, graduated, and then came back to the hospital in Sierra Leone uh, where they'd been recruited and, and started working there. But the difference is that they've not only got the learning, which they would have got anyway because we, we train on the job, but they've got the formal recognition and the formal certification. So that empowers them. For more from this interview, subscribe to Imaginize World on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcasts.